Thank you, Bells, for your music this morning. I'm Pastor Dale Olson, and Pastor Jennifer's on vacation, so a warm welcome to all of you this morning. And I'm glad that all, some of you at least, aren't at the Super Bowl game today. You're here in worship. That is really nice. So anyway, uh, let, us, uh, well, uh, let us begin our worship this day. Let us rise. <laughs> our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we, we pour our hearts out our hearts to you. you. We have we known have you, but have not always loved you. you. We have known you, one another, and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen.
and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from two kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gigal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came up to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken up from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As I continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, 
and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The mighty one God, the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Our God will come and will not keep silence with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens to the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. A reading from Second Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who have shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Will the children please come forward? comes from the gospel. We're going to hear a big booming voice from heaven that say, says, listen to him. Now, it meant listen to Christ. So, tell me, who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Your parents. A good idea to listen to your parents. Yeah, exactly. What else? Pardon? Yeah. What about teachers? All, all sorts of things. Now, I have this, what is this? Yeah. So what is the football special about today? Anything? You want to help out? <laughs> it's Super Bowl, right? And um, there have been a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff about the Super Bowl. And the players, who do you suppose they listen to? Yeah. Their coach? Yeah, that would be a good idea. What else? Probably maybe the quarterback to tell them what the play is going to be and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Well, yes. They could listen, a good idea to listen to the referee if uh, something goes uh, wrong. Right, you're good, yeah. So, uh, 
Jesus, they're going to say, you're going to need to listen to Jesus when you go down to the mountaintop because you're going to be going to the ends of the earth to tell about who Jesus is. Which brings me to another word. Now this is in Aramaic because Jesus spoke in Aramaic. He didn't speak in English. He spoke in Aramaic. And the word is imuna. Can you say it? Imuna. Can you say it? Imuna. And that literally means to stand firm in your faith. Hold on to faith. And he's going to be telling the disciples over and over again that they need to hold on to their faith. In fact, I believe that Jesus says that to us. Hold on to your faith. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, help us to hold on to our faith. Help us to hold on to our faith. To believe. To, to believe. And to tell others. And to tell others. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Let us pray. Gracious God, this is Transfiguration Sunday. Help us, O oh Lord, to see in all the awe and the majesty and the dazzling of white. Help us in some way to grasp who you are as this divine, as Son of God, living God, who comes and tells us to hold on to our faith. Wherever we are, whatever season we are this day, help us so that we may hold on to believe in you, in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, today, gospel. Gospel. oh, we forgot the gospel. Oh, of course, we need to write, read the gospel. Thank you. <laughs> You know, you can tell I don't do this all the time. That's why. <laughs> the gospel today is, uh, let's do the uh, Alleluia. Let us rise. Yes. <laughs> took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. For they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Change is in the air. For the disciples, they're going to be moving from one season of life to another. Jesus is like a CEO who takes 12 of his closest associates, and they're going to go on a retreat. And then three of them are going to go up on a mountain and pray for the night. But before we talk any more about that, I'd like to share about a young man who also was going through a, a season of life and moving to another season of life. This man was told by his parents that he was going to be suddenly moving from Venezuela to America. And this was a few years ago where they, could, they would come legally uh, to America. So listen to his words. I didn't really understand why we had to move to the United States. When my parents first told me we were planning on leaving, they kept telling me things are getting worse and dangerous. 
it was clear we would leave at the end of the school year. My parents told me that we would be one or two years until things got better, and then we could come back. I cried more than I'd like to admit. I cried in bed, in the shower, in the bathroom. It got so bad that my, once my mother yelled at me for stop crying while I was in the shower. The cafeteria was a nightmare. I became overconscious of how awkward I was being. I never felt more isolated than during the 30 minutes of lunch every day. I'd often go to the restroom and spend as much time in there because at least being alone and closed in four walls of the stall didn't make me feel as lonely as being in the sea of voices that I just couldn't keep up with. Well, I hired that young man in his senior year of high school. And he went on to college and he is doing very successful in college. I think this is his, probably his last year of college. And he would look back and he would think and say, that that was probably the best season of life that he could have gotten at that time when moving from Venezuela to America. All of us have experienced those seasons of life where we've moved. We don't have to move from country to country. Sometimes we move from state to state. I remember when we told our boys that they were moving to Chicago from Minneapolis and they thought they were going to die. <laughs> Sometimes it's a divorce situation where you move and you've raised your children in a particular house and now a new season of life when you have a new location. Or sometimes it's a doctor that says there's nothing more to do. A new season of life. Or sometimes it's just your boss expects more of you. All of us have experienced that and Jesus is going to expect more from his disciples today because they were once called, but today is like a confirmation. This is really confirmation day for the disciples. Prior to the gospel, the words boom out. He began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things, rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and be killed. You see, Jesus is forewarning the disciples that life is going to get tougher. In a few years, Jerusalem, the beloved Jerusalem, will be in ruins. You will be told you will have to flee to Asia Minor and to the ends of the earth. You will be imprisoned. You will be beaten. This world is not going to be as nice as it is right now. Well, in terms of interpreting scripture, sometimes it's really important for us to look before and after the text. And today is a good example of being able to look before what's happening in the gospel because Mark 8, 8 is just as important for the gospel as the gospel itself. Because it tells us that they went to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is just north of the Sea of Galilee, 25 miles. It's the mouth of the Jordan River. It's this big gushing water that comes and begins the Jordan River. And in 3 BC, they created a, a god named Pan, P-A-N. And he was half goat and half human, they would say. And uh, they would worship him. And in Caesarea Philippi, uh, there are all sorts of shrines and gods all around. And uh, some would call it the gateway to hell. And interestingly, Jesus takes his disciples, he walks 25 miles and takes them to this retreat there in the city of Caesarea Philippi and then he looks around and he says, look around. So you see all these gods, who do you say that I am? And of course the answers come back, Elijah and John the Baptist. And then Peter gets it right. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the disciples will have to get this right as they go on to the ends of the earth. So then the gospel today, it says that six days later, they will go up to a mountain. And there's a mountain, Mount Hermon, right next to Caesarea Philippi, which gives us a clue of what mountain it is. And they will go up, these three, three disciples, and they will, of course, they will fall asleep, which is kind of usual for the disciples. 
and then they will be awakened to this dazzling white. They will see Moses, who represents the law, and they will see Elijah, which represents the prophets. Every Seder feast, every Seder feast, before this and after this, they will have, leave an a empty chair for Elijah to come, because Elijah is supposed to come at the end of the world. And here, right before, Peter doesn't know what to do with him. At first, he just wants to somehow save this whole event. But it's more than that. As they will walk down from the mountain in this extraordinary, this awe-filled day, they will have to know about what Jesus is going and Jesus is doing. You know, when we, whenever there's God intersects humans, when Moses, with the burning bush, there was both awe, but there was also fear involved as we come to see God. And for the disciples, it must be the same thing. They didn't say anything to anybody until probably after the resurrection. Sometimes these moments are hard to kind of figure out what it is. So let me share with you a story from a man that we met the last time Aline and I went to Israel. And uh, there was a brand new museum along the Sea of Galilee. And he told a story. He said he had uh, immigrated from uh, Russia to Israel. And he said uh, there was one year where, uh, well, I, I told God, if you are real, that you're going to have to show me in some way. Because I don't, as right now, I do not believe in a God. So he said one year there was a drought in Israel. And so the shoreline was shore was very large and he could walk out way far and uh, suddenly he was walking one day and uh, he saw this uh, something protruding out of the sand and he looked at it and sure enough it was an old boat of some sort that he was it was poking out of the sand and over these next few days he became obsessed with that boat he was determined that that boat, he was going to get out of the sand and he was, going to, he was going to figure out how old it was. Incidentally, that boat was about the time of Jesus. And so, to his surprise, he has multiple visions of how to get this boat out of the sand, including leeches and all sorts of things. Well, at the end of the story, he did. He was able to get most of the boat intact out of the sand, and now it sits in the museum. But the most important part is that he gets to come every day where tourists and visitors come, and he gets to tell the story. The ones that he, he did not believe, and God somehow sent visions upon visions to him so he'd get the boat out, and now he believes in this Jesus Christ, where the boat dates somewhere close to the time of Jesus. Umuna, figuring out about faith. And Jesus, as they will go to the ends of the earth, the disciples will go to the ends of the earth, he will give them visions of all sorts. And it will burn in their hearts as they will go down the mountaintops. If you go to um, Rome and see that, I don't know if any of you have seen the catacombs, but they're pretty interesting. Because these early disciples, they didn't just be buried, but they wanted to be buried and they, uh, they painted pictures and images and all sorts of things to let the rest of their relatives and friends and people know uh, who is it that they believed in? Who is it that they served to the ends of the earth? Jesus will tell his disciples about Umuna, that they will need to stand firm in their faith that they face all sorts of things. Now let's talk about um, God moments. Because we hear God moments from people all the time. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Sometimes when we feel a call to God, our rational side picks in and say, well, do you think this is the right time or the right place? Or do you think that, uh, that I ought to be doing this? Then the emotional side kicks in and, and uh, it feels all of the mystery and all the fear and, and the anxiety and leaving. You know, our son always said during college that he was going to go 
someday I'm going to go on a mission. And then he called one day after college. And he said, Mom, Dad, guess where I'm going on a mission trip? And then he said the country name was Iraq during the first Iraqi war. And I was, of course, at least, I don't know about Lee, but I was convinced that he was going to be killed there. He set up the uh, humanitarian uh, health clinics and, uh, and water treatments and so forth. Well, he made it through by the grace of God. But all of us, there's another side of the of rational and emotional, and also there's the spiritual side. The spiritual side that says, I know God is calling me. And so no matter what, I will follow my Lord. And that's where the disciples are today as they walk down, because they're going to face all sorts of dilemmas, all sorts of per persecution, and all sorts of new seasons, all because they have chosen to follow their Lord. Let me share with you another God moment. There's a woman who was in about 40 feet of water. She was a good swimmer, she said. She got out alone. It was a beautiful day. The water was warm and clear. And then suddenly she felt a cramp. And she realized how foolish she was. She began to sink and she began to watch her life be, uh, slip away. She said, I thought, I, I can't go on like this. I have things to do. I just can't die anonymously without anybody knowing where I am. So she called out, God, help me. At first she thought an image was near her. At first she thought it was a shark. And then she said it was the most beautiful, marvelous eye that I'd ever seen. It was the eye of a dolphin. And that dolphin began to lift her to the surface. His dorso fin under my armpit and she said suddenly my stomach uh, cramp was subsided and she realized that, that, uh, that she could relax. She said that that dolphin had drew me all the way to the, by the shore, made a little sound and off it, it went. For her, it was a God moment. A God moment in some way that who saved her. She doesn't understand it. It doesn't rational side, emotional side. It's simply the spiritual side that says, God, thank you for whatever you did. Thank you by the grace of God. So today, we have this word, imuna. Imuna means to stand firm with God. And we've all gone through those seasons where we all have been tossed to a new season of life and we're wondering, how is life ever going to turn out the way I want? And this imuna that Jesus is going to tell his disciples, that you're going to hang on to faith because I will be with you to the ends of the earth. A couple days ago, Aline and I, we, uh, we spoke to our, our former foreign exchange student. When she was a high school student, senior in high school, she came from Norway and spent a whole year with us. And um, she almost left the first week because the rule in our house was that all children in our household had to go to church. And uh, she wasn't, that wasn't her history. That wasn't her tradition. And so she would go to, finally go to church with us, and then our boys invited her to another youth worship in the morning at a kind of a citywide youth worship and so forth. And she was telling that about, she said, I'm amazing. I went from zero hours in church on a Sunday to about five hours on a Sunday morning in worship. And, and, um, but interestingly, over that whole year, her graduation, we gave her a brand new Bible. And that meant everything to her. And to this day, she's got four children, and she's trying to teach her own children about faith and how is it to hang on to your faith in a, sometimes a society that doesn't uh, treasure going to church on a regular basis. Well, she calls us her spiritual parents. <laughs> You see, we all have those influences, and the disciples would influence countless of people. They will be the faces of Jesus when they go to the ends of the earth. So, I have a Bible verse for you as you go to the ends of the earth this week. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
Say these words. It is no longer I who live. But Christ who lives in me. But Christ who lives in me. God bless you. Amen. our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father and Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in much of his was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day the world rose again. He ascended to heaven. And it is seated at the right hand of the Father, and you will come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation invited to sit, kneel, or stand. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation.
face. We pray for the creation that we will humbly observe the swirl of wind and the heat of the bright sun. Teach us to honor all you have made and to care for the animals, plants, air, and bodies of water of this planet. care to any in need. We pray for any who are sick and suffering, especially the family of Sally Taylor, Ashlyn, Joanne, Christ, the Church of Shelbyville, and their pastor, Rick Stevenson, Mark, Sandy, Gilbert, Lynn, Horace, Robert, JC, Jane, Jane, Sherry, Jim, Ted, and those we name aloud now and the signs of our hearts. The assembly is invited at this time to present other petitions. For our military, police, firefighters, emergency. teachers and caregivers. Trusting that all the saints, prophets, and those who die in faith are held in your care. To remember in Thanksgiving those who have died. Grant us your gift of salvation as we await your coming of King's glory. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Share God's peace with one another.
bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table, that we receive what we seek, and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We, will seek, we will speak the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. And so with the church and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O holy God, you are the life and light of all. By your powerful word you created all things. Through the prophets you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your son. He is your light, shining in darkness and revealing to us your mercy in night. The night in which he betrayed our Lord Jesus, took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is my new covenant and my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his preaching and healing, his dying and his rising, and his promise to come again, we await the day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your spirit, bless us in this meal, that refreshed with this heavenly food, we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father and the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Now come and see.
Let us rise. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food, and we are Christ's body. Raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all, and to your glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Just a couple announcements. First of all, we are saddened by the death of Sally Kaler, and uh, funeral arrangements are still pending for that. So uh, please, your prayers be with the whole family with that. Then today, we have Strove Tuesday. It's going to be right here in just a few minutes. You know, Strove Tuesday is a tradition that they would get rid of all the, the staples like sugar and flour and all that and clear it out of the house and uh, you know, make pancakes and whatever. So, so the youth are uh, sponsoring a pancake breakfast immediately following that, so give your support uh, to that. Then Wednesday, Wednesday is, is Ash Wednesday, and the services are at noon and at seven o'clock, and it's also Valentine's Day. So I hope that you remember all those loved ones around you, so you're gonna have to kind of, you know, Ash Wednesday as well as, uh, as uh, uh, Valentine's Day. Keith, you have something. Last fall, we had a, a handbell that needed to be repaired. This is it. And you don't see it, but there's a very fine fracture through here. And we found out it could not be repaired. It needed to be replaced. Uh, these are not cheap. And um, luckily, we were able to replace this handbell with funds uh, in our handbell fund, uh, many of which were given by uh, the estate of uh, Marilyn Hollister, Sue's mother, and Sue's here with us this morning. And so what do you do with a handbell that no longer can be used? Uh, there's not a big demand for these on eBay or anywhere. So uh, we said, you know what, we want, to, uh, we want to make a little memento for Sue uh, and her mom. So Sue, if you would come forward. Um, Mr. Marriott made a nice little uh, desk for this bell, and um, we had a little plaque made that says, an appreciation for Sue Hollister in honor of Marilyn Hollister from the St. Timothy Worship and Music Ministry. <laughs> We are very grateful for Sue because she served on our, continues to serve on our worship and music committee. Uh, her mother was uh, very involved with handbells. Sue has been involved with handbells. So just a little memento for her uh, to keep. Thank you, Sue, for, for everything. Thank you, Keith. Let us rise. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, Assist us in this ministry in which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this sacrament, that through the body and blood of your Son we may know the comfort of your abiding presence. Amen. Amen.
the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. God who is ahead of you, guide you. God is behind you to encourage you. God is beside you to walk with you. God is above you to watch over you. And God who is inside of you, dwell in peace. Amen. 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 Amen.